This video presentation is made possible by the SLO County Department of Education and the SLO Co Arts Collaborative. For over a century, the Central Coast of California has been a haven for people from all walks of life. Pioneers, entrepreneurs, farmers, innovators, artists, dreamers. People escaping the city life to find beautiful landscapes, rich culture, seeking prosperity, and most importantly, joy. For a lot of us, we find joy in art, whether we're makers or just lucky enough to enjoy the art of others. Hi, I'm Peter Henry Schroeder. I'm a local documentary filmmaker here in San Luis Obispo County. I invite you to come with me now as we actually get to go talk to some of these artists firsthand and learn about what makes them tick. What are some of the challenges they face and how do they do this on a day-to-day -day basis? Where does their inspiration come from and how do they actually find the joy in their art? What really gives them that creative juice? Hi, I'm John Harms. I work here at Daniels Woodland in Paso Robles, California. I'm a theming artist, I'm a fine artist, I'm a sculptor. I do robotics, animatronics, themed effects, uh, fire effects, water effects. It's things to do in this industry. You can't just wear one hat in this industry, so kind of a I'd say moulage of everything together. <laughs> probably seen a lot of my work over the years and never known it was me. And actually that's probably the standard for this kind of industry. I can quite honestly say I've been doing this kind of work for well over 40 years. It's a lot of lifting, bending, and toting, but at the end, you can make some pretty cool stuff that people get to see. I've kind of always been an artist. My family's kind of in the trades one way or another. My mother was an oil painting artist and I definitely pull up on that side, then my dad being more of the craftsperson and the tradesperson and the cement and masonry side. So we always combined those things. And then my mother always worked with my father. She would do a lot of decor work on top of the work he's doing. Maybe there was painting murals on the wall. We did a lot of stuff in the early days in, in good lord, back in Ventura, California. I think Wellman Jews was the first time I ever did a tree, and I was probably maybe 10. My mother painted a large mural behind it, and my dad sculpted the tree. A lot different than what I do now, but the thought was there. Uh, originally, strange enough, I was, out of my family, I was the only one born in Oxnard, California. I know, the rest of my family are all Canadians. <laughs> so, they all left Canada, came from Edmonton. My dad was a dual citizen, so he, he came down, moved back to Oxnard, California, doing brick and stone work. So when I started doing this, there really wasn't a place or a house that you go to learn all this stuff. And most of this stuff was just kind of you picked it up along the way. I, I did a lot of work originally in automotive industry, cars, I kind of got into the airbrush van murals back in the 70s. And then I got into the robotics industry, early robotic industry. I had the chance of working with a company called Valley Decorating. Strangely enough, she was out of Fresno. And that's where we were doing a lot of uh, decor items for the malls, the middle of the mall, those terrible creatures that sing to you as you would buy and keep you in the malls. So we did a lot of that over as time went by, and then it kind of progressed from there to doing small-scale robotics, which was taking characters and making the molds, and so now I had to learn how to make molds. So you take molds, and there's different kind of molds. Back then, we were using plaster Paris and basically hemp. You'd mix the thing together, and that's how you made your molds. You'd cast your parts out of that using what's called dwell casting. So then you'd pull apart, and you had just this stiff thing in the middle, so you had to cut it, shape it, bend it, put it in angles. It just kind of kept progressing from there. And the next thing I ended up doing, I ended up working for a fairly large company out of um, Newhall area. At the time it was called Creative Presentations. And we did a lot of shows there, everything from E.T. to um, Moonwalker. So Michael Jackson worked there. It was one of the Universal Studios rides there as well. And then I did a lot of work on the sculptures and molds for E.T. the ride. Uh, Universal Studios, when it first came out, E.T. was popular. So we're, we were hauling E.T. skins all over. And that was a pretty uh, novel experience mostly because it's the first time we pushed some pretty hardcore robotics, micro robotics, where we're using hydraulic pneumatics and little tiny fingers and movements and stuff. And then you had to cover it with a special skin that kind of mimics so you could read all that stuff. So a lot of work for ET, uh, did some work for, good lord, some of the stuff I did for Disney goes back a hundred years, but got the chance to work on the original molds for It's a Small World. And it seems simple. But those original molds were made for a World's Fair back in 51, 52. Those things were interesting characters because they're dressed from their underwear out of whatever that nationality or whatever that area ethnicity is. 
to go to those rooms of those original molds and you have to rebuild all the molds. We're back there made of plaster Paris and hemp and stuff and then you open up these molds that are just like decades old. <laughs> it's like, that's the scariest stuff I've ever seen. So you really had to figure the engineering facts so things would still look lifelike and program right and give that effect to the, the guy who's doing the final programming on the characters which do your moves and, and your shapes back then. Worked at New Hall and then New Hall to Las Vegas and that's kind of where I've been for the last 17 years. I worked with Simon and Property Group there and quite a few other houses there, MGM, did work on there, worked with Stair, worked with, um, the last one I did there was Caw, I worked on that. From a small scale, I said the original of Fountains, Talking Statues, which was one of the first pieces in Las Vegas. And that's where we created a whole environment where it was just, it looked like they were just statues. But we painted them to look like marble and they had the whole feel. When it first opened up, that thing suddenly coming to life freaked people out because I thought that was marble. You didn't realize you could marbleize silicones and things like that. Did a complete redo and re-inhabit of the Treasure Island show. Giant, giant pieces of work of actual boats and things like that. The hydraulics are involved to dunk those things. I used to have to, I painted half of, or actually the whole facade at one point or another across Treasure Island off of ropes. They have pictures of me hanging from ropes because there's no other way to get them. You know, sometimes we actually had to be in rowboats painting big boats on top that are eventually going to sink underwater and come back up again. Tracy Stum, whose artwork is incredible, she's the one that started sidewalks that when you looked at them, it looked weird, but when you looked at it at a certain spot, it all made sense. It was a 3D, all the sidewalk painting, especially in Santa Barbara, she's well, 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 well known and established. She had did some TED Talks and all that. And, her work is amazing and I've worked with her quite a bit on a lot of the optical illusions and the paintwork and the artwork on the ceilings all through Caesars. There's a large entranceway. The large entranceway was a domed ceiling and it originally had an odd, horrible texture on it because it was a, we're trying to quiet all the slot machines below and everything in, in that area are all domed. So it becomes this massive reflective surface. So in order to do those surfaces, after they scraped them off, they really became a reflective surface. So now I can be standing here and someone 30 feet can hear me, the person next to me can't hear me. It's just the reflective dome aspect. And then you have to figure, okay, we want to cover that with a series of paintings. The only way you could do that, the way it's done now specifically, is we'd make a mock-up of what a quarter scale section of that dome would look, and then you paint on that section, take a photograph, and then you take that, you paint on it with canvas, and you pull the canvas off, you lay it on flat, and you take a photograph. And we did that thousands of times to get the complete imagery. Then we'd have a house to do all the printing, so it's printed almost like an oil canvas would look like. And it's and this is where kind of a lot of it, when you talk about artistic, it's not just knowing, oh, I can paint a canvas. How do I make it attach? What type of glues do I need to use? What kind of scaffolding do I have to do to rig this stuff up? Combination of how do I make this go? Also, maybe how do I build it? Anybody does this as an industry, you, you have to wear a lot of hats, you know, and, and case in point, and you, you learn from that, but then I also had to end up learning how to do water effects and pumping and fountains and, and fire effects. I've been a licensed pyrotechnician for over 20 years. I set fire to many, many spots in Las Vegas all the way through there from the fountains out front to the shows inside with 30 foot flames. And I worked with a gentleman called John Rogers and he produced some of the world of color that won effect in uh, Las, in the Disneyland. That's the fire effects he did. He's the one that worked with him. We put the original volcano in there. He was, he was my sponsor to become a licensed pyrotechnician as well. So set fire to boats and set fire to volcanoes and set fire to whatever you can think of. It. Eventually you learn how to build the equipment to do it, what it takes to make it. So I know it's a 30 foot flame, but how do I get to do a 30 foot flame? And how do I make that occurrence happen that it's not going to be around or catch somebody in fire? So that's so what I'm talking about as an art kind of thing. It's like, where do you go? If some people are really, really comfortable in doing a style. Let's go use Madame Tussauds Wax Museum where they're working on things. Everybody has their own way of doing something. And every, every art form has its own you know, way of doing something. And some people are, I, I look at in awe of what they can do with lighting, what they can do with graphics. And, and, and the technology's changed so much that it makes my life a lot simpler and it opens up a lot of venues by attaching what I do to what else is being done. So it just over the years I've worked in so many different places and worked with so many amazing people that, you know, I, I've, I take that motto, surround yourself with people that know more than you do. I've got some of the most talented people that do better than I do. You know, it's kind of nice to see that, that, you know, they, like 
they'll cuss me out at first because I'm using material that just doesn't make any sense. I can't put this crap on the wall. But after a bit, you realize why, what it does, and it becomes a tool for their, their belt buckle to kind of hang on the wall too. So that's, that's for me now, is, is kind of cool. I really enjoy doing that. I, like, I enjoy training, I like teaching. I still love doing what I do. And I, I still like the organic aspect of all this stuff. It's, it's, it keeps me interested all the time. Especially the last while for me, it's been mimicking nature. And it always has been. I think I've always had a, a fondness for trying to make things that are, let's just call it artificial, look real. And, and it's not just that. In order to do that, you really have to study the semantics of what it takes for a tree to grow. You know, if someone says, I want a mangrove, or someone says, I want a a manzanita or oak. There, there's a lot of different ways of doing that, but it's not just saying I can paint it. When you're, especially when you're trying to do the sculpture aspect or textures or whatever it is. This is a kind of an example. This is a tree, we're sitting here in a park, and the mimicry of this is to look at it. Most people think a tree is brown or this color or that color. It really is a, a series of, of layers of color, of saturation, of time, and half of the stuff is trying to mimic that and here you can see the age of the moss what its lifespan is where's newer where's fresher and you know what's, what's happening here and when you're trying to mimic these looks you know aside from yeah I can take a mold off this tree and, and copy it exactly but you don't always have the availability of having a mold so you have to learn some of those processes to create that effect and then to get that layering because this layering on just the bark itself there's so many colors there's so many colors and how do you and, and you can easily find you know, five, six, ten, sometimes over a hundred different colors in a very small spot. So how to get that same feel? And that's happened because of time and, and the way the tree's grown, what directions it's in, you know, what's happened around it. Some are more gnarly because they were stunted at some point, and that's where you get those odd burls and stuff, and just the damages on a tree. An example of something why trees aren't perfect, they're, and that's everything about what makes life life. They're, they're not a static thing, they're always moving. It may be slow, you may not see it, but the reality is it's, when you're trying to get that mimic, you're trying to, trying to fill that point where people look at something and, and know it's always been there, feels like it's always been there, almost feels familiar to you. What people would say mistakes are, sometimes turn out to be your best, best things. And, you know, even going back to Bob Ross with his happy little rabbit, there's a good point. I messed this up, it's not gonna look right, so rather than make it try to look right, I'm gonna put something in there, and that, that's that, we always laugh about that. Here's a happy tree in the forest. And this is a good example of some of the stuff I do here, and this is a, a living tree here, a living oak tree, and the first thing you notice is the fact that and all of these are different. It really depends on what the light are and what you're trying to achieve. And sometimes you have to modify that look. But at the end of the day, if you were to get into this, what seems to be a grayer tree from the background, if you look down on the cores and stuff, a lot of these things you can see the brighter orangey reds that show. And some are extremely red on the inside. So in this case here, the process of mimicking this type of structure of a tree is, yes, it's sculpting. I'll use different mediums and materials to do that. If I'm doing it by hand, I do a lot of concrete trees. All these things are because they're layered. And you can see just by looking at how, how layered it is. It's a fibrous material, and not all wood's the same. Every wood has its own natural, and that's what you kind of go towards. But all that stuff at the end of the day, if you are to hold it up, is transparent. With colors, it's more of a dye as opposed to a pigment. So you can see how transparent all that stuff is. Even a leaf, I can hold a leaf up and hold the leaf up into the light, and you'll see that the green is in there. So what you perceive as a solid dark green is not a solid dark green, it's just so many layers. One of the reasons tortoiseshell becomes such an endangered species and because of people taking the tortoiseshell off it, is when you polish it and grind it down to its colors, it's just so many infinite layers to get that look. See as it loses its strength, or I should say where the fibers are really bound together, it really starts to show how light those colors really are. It's only the gathering that starts to form the compression of color. But at the end of the day, it's just many, many, many layers of color. So in all those processes, we build up to the colors, I get the look I want. And after I get through the shock value of being the brightest color you've ever seen, you keep moving it down, moving it down. Then you use those hot colors in the grooves and in everything. And that's what makes it look real. It's not just, I painted a brown tree. It's not one color. The time I'm done with any color, if I have less than 15, 20 different shades on top of something, I would be surprised. 
even a rock, it looks like it's a rock. There's probably hundreds of little tiny particulates of paint inside that make the different colors. Mimicking life and trying to create that life out of things that are in your hands, you think it's a dead material, or mix this stuff up. It's not. There's just as much life in the material that you're using, and how you make it act like the life that you're trying to mimic is, is, is kind of the fun. It's part of the part of the tricks of this trade. As an example, things that are, this door is just, uh, you wouldn't realize it, but that's actually a, a fiberglass door that we incorporated, that I incorporated with a, some amazing help here. And it was just a sheet of white fiberglass. The trick was to age this thing, to give it the life and give it the uniqueness of that like it's been underwater, so the rust is there. And how we get the rust is, is, is actually kind of interesting. It's actually using iron powders. Uh, I also use uh, acids and different kinds of acids to get different colors and it's put on there and then weathered in such a way that you can almost see the runnels of, of age and stuff as it comes through there. So that's all fiberglass made to look like a solid chunk of iron surrounded by uh, panels of stone, like it was inset into an old stone panel and open and closed onto a whole different walkway. The challenges that you, you take on are, are huge because this line of work, this kind of industry, it's kind of designed as you go. You have a thought, you have a premise to go to, but to do it, you need a group of people, and that's what they do amazingly well here. So one of the things that are kind of interesting were uh, Ed drew up some amazing artwork for uh, a commercial building, one of the Daniels Woodlands commercial building, and we're trying to make that like, almost like a a Diagon Alley or Dadgum Alley, whatever you want to call it, kind of a feel to the whole thing. And so Ron Daniels came up and said, I need to have trees here. Uh, trees, <laughs> big trees. Then he came out with this picture. And these aren't small trees, these are big trees. Yet it's already a built ground, everything's solid in there. One of the challenges is how do I plant trees in the middle of an office space area? How do I make it look like the trees belong here? Or what came first, the whole chicken or the egg? In this case here we said, okay, the trees, we're growing, and just because you put concrete over them, we're not going to stop that. So the illusion was to create a tree, and it's it's a kind of a dark this whole area because time is done with light. It's kind of a dark tree. Not only do we have a tree coming out of the ground, when you look down at the base of the tree, you could see where it looks like ancient cobblestones have been pushed up. So we've involved not just the tree. I've now involved the the, the floor of the tree. And the floor of the tree, it's knocked all those chunks and bricks and mortar away. So what it's done is it's incorporated what was existing and now you've tied everything so it's not just a unit laid against the wall. People always have a habit of doing that. We always try to like really make it like it belong there or it's taking over or encompassing. So that was the challenge. Here it is, make two trees. We want stained glass windows over the top and an archway. And we don't have that much time to do it in. These are built a little different. I have different ways of building. Trees that I know are going to be hung on by people will have an iron structure. Trees that I know are decor only and only to hold up so much weight. So in this case, because of the look of the tree, because I wanted that long, sweeping, almost like a manzanita feel, we started with a rough print at the bottom, a rough print at the top, a footprint we like to call them, cut it out of plywood, put the next level up here, and we did that tree in two different halves because it was so big I couldn't put it all in one time. And so we built the tree that way. We took burlap and we used a cementitious liquid and freeze the burlap in that shape. So almost like drapery, you're able to steer it into the shape you want. Then after that hard shell or the egg shell, that effect goes on. And it came back with plasters and sculpting and medias. And we start building and layering on top of that and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And it does have a, in this case here, just a wood interior because it's, no one's climbing on this tree. But it's still extremely strong, don't get me wrong still a cement tree at the end of the day. And then the next part of this whole thing is theming those two trees together so it looks like they're one tree, each one, and then how to create it from the floor. So it was, uh, in that case, we were able to utilize burlap, plaster, wood, uh, sculpting media, concrete, and uh, another material that we use that we can sculpt with as well. The last part is the actual, all the greenery that gets attached to these things, because that's what adds the life. Unless you're using, trying to make a, a desert scene, you got to add life to everything you do. It, that little touches, and it could be just the smallest thing, it could be a bug, it could be a bird nest, 
And that's what I think we're really classic for here is just adding that life. Like it was a frozen moment in time that things were interacting. So to give you a little idea, some of the things that are happening here, just to explain what we do, it's, this is a, basically a bare wall on the inside. We're eventually going to turn this whole thing into a very elaborate uh, mechanized clock, astro astronomical clock, as well as it's a big gear opener. And it's just an absolutely beautiful thing. When it gets to the top and it's locked in, it lets you know. So what this door, the big giant things will slide open. These two long rafters here will slide out of the way. And in the middle of that is going to be a big gear clock system. So these are all hand sculpted bricks, rocks. We actually use a special kind of cement. We are able to sculpt it, shape it, put it together. And then you stain it and wash it and people step back and look at it and think you got a wall that come from the ruins of whatever time frame you can think of. We've done everything from Pompeii, Herculaneum to, I can't really tell you all the amount of places we've done, including water features here. So as a, another example of all the things you can do is like, what do I do as an artist? Part of it is, here's a speeder from a, one of the Star Wars kind of movies. This was done by a combination of fiberglass as well as steel and metal. These are all hand carved bears. These are done with a chainsaw. A lot of it has to deal with history, from the erosion of history, the time. So when you do something, here you see something as simple as a stamped concrete floor, horse prints, tracks, and those that naturally would occur in that time frame. So you think back what happens to things as erosion or as wear happens. And so we kind of, all that's incorporated. So a lot of history is involved with trying to produce the right effect for the right job. And we'll just wander in here. We've added a lot of science, a lot of technology to make things really, really old. So as we go through these different areas, plastics here, these are 3D printed. We have a machine here, one of the largest in California, actually, it's a huge mass of it. So we 3D print, we go into this area here, and these all become time studies where, once again, what do you do for a living as an artist? And this is all concrete. In this section, what we're doing here, woodwork and concrete. And everything you see here, none of it's real. None of it's blocked put together. So here's another process we use. It looks like a whole shelf of books. So we use vacuum forming and we stack books and stuff. So in the end, when this is finally put in, these become shelves that open up and things hide behind it. So once again, we're just extending the illusion of something that's there, but not really there. So it's kind of fun. And we did all these things. And so we have two periods of time that are coming together here. This is kind of a Polynesian flare going through here, going to back to castle walls and structures. The rubble's broken down, it's fall. We've had to patch and repair it. Oh Lord, it's still fog, patch and repair. So that's kind of the effect you go. But then what makes it interesting to add life to these things is, all right, so now time goes by trees come and grow through it, just like trees and all that stuff wants to just come out of everything. So we just let it do that. So we enhance that kind of thing and we sculpt in. These are partial real branches added to actually sculpted. So part of our skill sets here is sculpting inanimate animate objects as well. Here's once again just an example of wear and tear. Here's a step, almost like a old style Ukrainian or one of those older type of areas where the stoops are out front and been going for a long time and they've been eroded over hundreds of years and this will be an apothecary. So part of the illusions that are happening here in this wall and down below as well as in this area here is monitors, TV screens that'll go behind that. But when they come on, they'll give you a glimpse of what happened in the past. So there'll be workers down below, you'll see their shadows here. In this case here, this whole picture will be a picture of the apothecary grinding his materials and everything else back there so it'll look like he's back in there. Kind of shadowy under flickery candlelight. And that's kind of the whole illusion. What you see here is still pretty fresh so when we're kind of all happy the way we look, then we come in and make us really, really dirty and old. So all the weathering and all that stuff goes up and down. I mentioned this a little bit here, but this is kind of a fun area. This is an area that basically is going to be at the underground area of a sewer system. So as the underground area of a sewer system, we're looking 1700s, late 1600s. And as you're going in these giant vaults that were under the city of London, as they went through it, the people that would work in these environments also had to know what was above him. So what they would do is they'd, I'm here, how do I know what's above me that I'm repairing? So I've given the address, it's under the Savoy Theater, or the Savoy Hotel. So this way they'd give indicators, we know it's the water closet, but at the same time, this is such an old piece, this represents a piece of work that hundreds and hundreds of years old, so it's collapsed, it's crashed, and we've had to patch and repair and during that thing, the storm drains, we kind of got weathered and wore out. And 
we have little friends and we stick up in there. We have a little dancing rat up there just to say hi to everybody as they come out of the restroom. That's Herbert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there's a lot of, and what we're showing here is a lot of different techniques as well as we can do this with stone, we can do this with brick, we can do this with polyurethane, plastic, steels. All these things are molded and hand sculpted. It's just a combination of different techniques and kind of has where you go. A lot of anything is just getting really, really comfortable with what you do. You're still going to have moments you still can't get through it. You're still going to have moments that you just are a complete block and it doesn't matter what that is. If you're taking on this kind of a job or this kind of work for a living, a lot of it has to be just information. The more you can learn, the more information you gain for whatever you're doing. And I resource everybody. To this day, I resource people's styles, work, methodology. And I also go back in time and resource how they did it. So I, 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 I surround myself with people that have good, good knowledge. And if not, I find those people and seek them out. And once you have kind of a story, and I, that's actually a theme even for Daniels is, what's the story? That's the catchword since I got hired, what's the story behind it? And that's always been my way of thinking, so it kind of made it up pretty nice, is what is the story, what is time, what is... It? Then it gives you the ability at least to say, I can start here, because I know this one thing right here is a thousand years old, or it's a day old, or it's whatever it is. I'd say anybody that wants to get into the field of being an artist, which is like, where do you go with that? There, there's so many places to go, and that artist could be everything from a graphics game designer. It's really building up information. It's building up, I am going to be the artist that paints the best dog pictures in the world. If you start small, and I mean almost macroscopically, where I, I know I want to make a dog, I'm just using an example of anything, and some of the best work is they all they, they learn how to define just how the hair lays. So it's information that you have. It's whatever your element is, whatever you're studying and whatever you're doing, whatever type of painting, whether it's cubist, whether it's impressionist, whether it's realist, it's a tropholoi, or whether it's sculpture, additive or subtractive, it really is knowing what it's going to be and understanding the process that's going to take to get there. Just if you're, if you're in school, and you're learning how to then grab every bit of information from your teachers, from whoever's there, and find out not what they did right. Find out what they did wrong. And from what they did wrong, that's how you learn what to do is right. And just, just eat it up, and then express yourself, and then put it out of your own hands. And don't let technology be a limitation. Let it be a tool. Don't let sculpting materials be a limitation. Let it be a tool. Some of the best work came because it wasn't what everyone intended. And all of a sudden, something else happened. It was like, that was what I intended. But now that I see it, that's where I want to go. And allow that freedom. Don't get locked into something. Your, your goal as an artist really is to be locked into something that lets you, you know, what you do and what your skill sets are. It's commercial, whether it's individual, residential, whatever it is. Let your skill sets come out. Just to be there. Most of all, be tenacious. Just when everybody's over your shoulder going, that looks horrible, just wait.